Well, I've, uh, I've been to annual conference, and I kind of want you to know what that's all about. All of the churches in our conference, in every Methodist conference, which includes a bunch of districts, and for 150 years we have been the Central Texas Conference. We're not anymore. It ended, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. And ministers and representatives from all of the churches in a conference get together to do the business of that conference, uh, to elect people to conference offices, uh, to talk about the budget for the next year, uh, to pass resolutions of all kinds. And uh, for the last few years, we've been engaged in this great effort to get delegates elected to general conference, fighting the great fight to get that language, that negative language about gay people out of the book of discipline. And finally, at this last general conference, which is the Methodist church all around the world, it has been accomplished and there's a kind of a, there's a kind of a joy at this year's annual conference, a hope for a new beginning, and the feeling that now we can proclaim the gospel in a new way and not just proclaim it, but we can actually live it. And, and there is nothing impeding us. There is no ugly language against anybody in our book of discipline, our book of order that the church follows and that we, that we have to follow as a, as a church. We met in Round Rock, Texas, just north of Austin, in a great and beautiful United Methodist Church, First Church of Round Rock. It is really big, and the conference filled the whole lower floor. I didn't know there were that many of us left anymore, but st still a lot of Methodists, even though we've lost about a third of our churches in this conference. And the Northwest Conference lost so many churches, that's up in the Panhandle and on down this way, that they had only a lot of country churches. Uh, so they had only 12 churches left. And uh, what happened at this annual conference is that we united that Northwest Conference with the Central Texas Conference and the great North Texas Conference, which include Dallas and surrounding areas, they all united with us, or we united with them. The three were put together, which means a big geographical era, era, area. I don't know how many churches are in it, with only one bishop. We used to have a bishop for just this, con this conference, but now we have a bishop for what's called the Horizon Conference. That's who you, what you're in, and uh, it covers what was three conferences, but now we're one, and we're all here under Bishop Reuben Sains, who is a lovely, lovely man. The acoustics in the Round Rock Church were absolutely horrible. It's a problem they've had. Sometimes you can have beauty and great acoustics. We have both here. This is a beautiful church. Did you know that if you drop a pin out on the road in front of this church, you can hear it standing back at these doors. Do you believe that? You're not as gullible as I thought you were. <laughs> Donald Trump said that something that you say does not have to be true. He said, I'm quoting, he said, if you say it, people will believe it. Well, he seems to be able to get away with it, but I can't. So, no, but anyway, we've got nice acoustics. But also, I was sitting in a, in a bad place. I was only 20 feet from the pulpit, but I was way around to the side. And actually, I couldn't see what was going on, and I couldn't be seen. And that was on purpose, because I didn't want the bishop to see me on my little buggy over there, <laughs> on my little walker, because of my current knee problem. I thought he might decide I'm old and decrepit. So I was kind of hiding out from the bishop. We had to get there early for those uh, meetings uh, when we could because 
uh, if I parked way down in the parking lot, you had to ride one of those little shuttle buses that they sent around this big, big parking lot for this big church. They do it on Sundays, too. We don't, we don't need a shuttle bus here at St. Matthew. I don't know why. We just don't need it. <laughs> but they do. And anyway, I discovered that with my impediment and with my left knee, it was all I could do to get up on the shuttle bus. So especially on that last evening, which was Tuesday evening, it was a Monday and Tuesday meeting with evening worship services. Um, I made sure I got there early enough so that I could uh, get in there and get a parking place up close to the church so I wouldn't have to ride the little shuttle bus. And uh, when we came into the sanctuary, really, uh, there wasn't, almost wasn't anybody there. And so I started down the aisle to my hiding place over to the right of the chancel area. And I was walking along, and I heard, hey, Max Brennan. It was the bishop. <laughs> so I couldn't hide, <laughs> but I did get a chance to... Uh, tell him why I, why I was hobbling along and to remind him that I'm only 45. So uh, anyway, I had a good talk with the bishop. He is an absolutely wonderful, wonderful person. And here, right before the Lord, I give thanks for Bishop Reuben Sainz, who has brought us through this very, very difficult and complicated uh, time. And also... Uh, our district uh, superintendent, Philip Rose, who is a wonderful, wonderful person. And they have all been dealing with all of this chaos, uh, getting us ready for the General Assembly that made that, that made that great decision. Yes, we've had, our, we've had our losses, but you know what they say, no pain, <laughs> no gain. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine, dear friend, uh, wonderful, guy and wonderful preacher, Scott Youngblood, uh, at the annual conference. And Scott was and I were saying that if we had run a few people off years ago with our preaching, we wouldn't have lost all of those churches. If we had taught people how to read the Bible, we wouldn't have lost all those churches. We would have been losing some people from time to time who would have gotten mad because preachers were preaching the real gospel of Jesus Christ, the inclusive gospel of Jesus Christ. The understanding that this, by the way, is our scripture today. And it is just this brief word. God is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Which simply tells us that God is kind to everyone. The ungrateful, the wicked, the good, the bad, the ugly. God loves us all the same and welcomes us. And certainly welcomes people who are gay or people who are minorities who have nothing wrong with them at all, except that's who they are. And that's the way God made them. And this is to be celebrated and rejoiced and to preach this gospel continually in the churches. Oh, we would have lost some people. We would have made some people mad. But the world out there would have looked at the United Methodist Church and said, Look at the welcome. They're living up to their motto, open hearts, open minds, open doors. This is the real thing. They're preaching what Jesus stands for. I think this is funny. There was one, there's one, we lost one very, very big church. It's in a, um, it's in a very wealthy Area. It was the largest church in our districts. Uh, <laughs> I talked to a, an employee of that church, a minister who was appointed there, actually, 
uh, a number of years ago, a woman. And uh, she was, uh, she said that the ministers there had to be exceedingly careful with their preaching. Because she said, we have, you know, we have a lot of MAGA people. And uh, they work very hard not to offend them. Can you uh, imagine how you have to twist the gospel to make it appeal to people who follow a man of vengeance? Yes, I'm talking now. Yes, I'm. Remember that, that scene in uh, that scene in uh, Midnight Cowboy, kind of a radical movie, where Dustin Hoffman was crossing the street and somebody was about to run over him, and he says, "I'm walking here. I'm walking here." Well, I'm talking here. I'm talking here. And we needed to we needed to be talking for a long, long time. The members of that church not only don't know the gospel, most of them. They have never heard the gospel because the ministers have been so careful not to offend anyone. They have not proclaimed the radical love of God for all of God's creation. The woman I was talking to, talking about was working with a uh, ministry to uh, parents of, of folks who had gay kids. And uh, I spoke to the group a couple of times, and uh, <laughs> she said, the church said she could have the group, but she couldn't tell anybody that they existed. It wasn't, it wasn't put out in any of the church <laughs> information. It was a secret ministry <laughs> to to gay folks and parents of gay folks and families of gay folks. It was a secret ministry because they were afraid to proclaim God's love for all of us. That church voted. I, I think this number is funny. I, this, this is the only church that I know of that voted like this. I don't know all of them. <laughs> they voted. This huge church voted. 99% to leave the United Methodist Church. And here we are. What does a church do when all of the Pharisees are gone? What does a church do when all the people who are angry at their neighbor are gone? Well, I don't know whether they laugh or cry but it just makes a church where nobody's fussing. Nobody was fussing at annual conference this year. It was a, it was a unified bunch because the fussing people left, the nagging people left, the people that didn't love their neighbor have left. And I can't say good riddance because, you know, <laughs> who are you going to preach to to convert? If all the folks that needed it most are gone, you know, you're kind of just celebrating and, and sharing together. But there's a whole world out there of people who don't know what the gospel is. Let me, let, let me talk to you just a minute about this. I want to tell you this. If you look up anything about the Bible or about the gospel on the Internet, you are going to find it more than likely comes from an ex a very conservative place, okay? You're not going to find a lot of Methodist stuff unless you deliberately go to Methodist stuff. It's going to be quite conservative. I sometimes look up stuff on the Internet, seeing what I can find. I came across this. Let me read it to you. And I want us to realize how astounding this is. Because, see, here's what happens. If you read the Bible, and this is what Scott Youngblood and I were talking about. If you read the Bible as if it is totally inerrant, as if every part of the Bible is of equal importance, Jesus gets lost. You've got 
you got the laws in Deuteronomy are equal with the teachings of Jesus. I mean, that story in Deuteronomy where they say if you have an unruly kid, teenage boy, he's, uh, he's drinking too much and he's a glutton. He's eating too much. Okay. <laughs> they say, and, and, he, and you can't straighten him out. They said, here's what I want you to do. Take that boy out to the gate of the city and call everyone together, and together, all of you will stone that boy to death as an example to the rest of the community. Well, on the glutton part of that, if my parents had done that to me, I, I, <laughs> in Kemp, Texas, if that had been the rule, I'd have been gone. I was certainly a glutton, not the drinker, but I was eating too much. I still may do a little of that. No, don't cut your stones out. Now, that story and its implications about the nature of God are equal in, in the minds of many millions of fundamentalist Christians with that word from our Lord, which was, of course, it is a radical word. It is a word that nobody had ever spoken on this earth before he spoke it. That God is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. I'm going to read you this. Many people claim that all people are children of God. But the Bible reveals quite a different truth. We are all his creation, yes. And under his authority, yes, and his lordship, and we will all be judged by him. By the way, I don't think you're going to hear the word love anywhere in this paragraph. But the right to be a child of God and call him Abba Father is something that only born again Christians have the right to do. When we are born again, we are adopted, adopted into the family of God. What does that song say that we opened with, which is based on scripture? In him we live and move and have our being. Redeemed from the curse of sin and made heirs of God. And part of the new relationship is that God now deals with us differently. He deals with us differently because we are members of his family. He deals with us differently from the way he deals with other people. <laughs> and then there's that line which says that God is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Jesus also says that God makes the sun to shine on the, on the righteous and on the unrighteous. In other words, Jesus says that God treats everybody with the same love because God loves everybody exactly the same and there is nothing and there's no power on earth or in heaven or in hell that can turn that love off that can keep God from loving us that way all of us the same however good we are however bad we are God is going to love us all the same this is the message of the gospel that God loves us unconditionally that's the meaning of grace unconditional love. I remember this when I was growing up in, in a, as a teenager in the Baptist church. I remember the definition of grace from our preacher. Grace is unmerited love. You don't have to measure up to get it. God's going to love you no matter what you do. In other words, there are a lot of ch churches where grace itself is not proclaimed the heart of the gospel but the Methodist church is determined not to be that place and if there are any other preachers listening what are you doing listening to me you're supposed to be preaching somewhere <laughs> I suggest you go ahead and preach the gospel tell it like it is tell it like Jesus says it is because if Jesus says it's that way it's that way. We don't need to preach in fear, but in faith. 
We don't need to preach looking for the approval of people, but preach to reach the hearts of people. We need to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let God do the work, the saving and restoring work. Join me in prayer. God of grace and glory, uh, let us pause this morning to thank you for the United Methodist Church, for what it means and for what it stands for now. Thank you for the journey that we have been on and for the the victory that we have won and the freedom to love everyone and let everyone love as God calls them to do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, gracious Lord. Thank you, you who gave yourself for all of us. Let us proclaim the gospel in such a way that others will know that they are loved and forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen.